Hello, everyone. I'm Olympia. Thank you for being here with me in this wonderful place called Lights Out Library. And I have a great story to tell you. So once upon a time, all the kings of Greece united in a war, a war against the most powerful city in the world, Troy. For ten long years, they besieged the city. The gods got involved in support of their champions. Countless warriors and many heroes fell on both sides. Finally, the Greeks vanquished the Trojans in no small part, thanks to a ploy imagined by the king of Ithaca. He instructed his troops to build a large hollow wooden horse in which Greek soldiers would hide, after which they would pretend to withdraw. They set their plan in motion and, blinded by the joy and relief that the war was finally over, though still worried as the gods had declared that Troy would fall, the Trojans dragged the horse inside their walls. That night, hundreds of Greek ships returned to the shore, and a small group of warriors led by Odysseus, who had remained hidden inside the horse, crept from their hiding place and slew the guards. They opened the city's doors from the inside, and that night they achieved through trickery, what for ten years force and bravery had failed to accomplish. Troy fell, defeated by a ruse. Some even said by a less than honorable strategy. But glory is always on the side of the victors and the Greeks celebrated by looting and destroying the city that had resisted for so long. The Greeks had remained far from home for such a long time that all of them, warriors and kings alike, now wished only to return home to their wives and to their land. Each king, each captain, led their men home. Families were finally reunited after ten long years of waiting, following the end of the war. Almost all Greek kings had returned, except one, Odysseus. As always, you do not need to watch the video to follow along. If you wish, you may close your eyes and forget about any worries as we embark on this adventure together. If you are so kind, please subscribe to my channel and click the like button. This helps support the channel and limits ads as much as possible. Please also follow us on Facebook for announcements. If you fall asleep and wish to resume the video later or to jump directly to a particular part of the story, timestamps are listed in the description below and also pinned in the first comment. Also below you will find links to different streaming options like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. But before we begin, assume a comfortable position. Take a long, deep, relaxing breath. When you exhale, release the tension in your shoulders. Release the tension in your facial muscles too and allow the sound of my voice to guide you through this journey. We're going to follow the steps of Odysseus, his wife Penelope, and his son Telemachus, as told in one of the most ancient known pieces of literature, The Odyssey by Homer. If you are interested in the events of the Trojan War, you can also listen to my other recent story about it, but this is not necessary to follow this one. 
As usual, I will tell you the episodes of the story, and in between we'll take a look at where they come from and what they meant to the ancient Greeks. What makes the Odyssey a singular work and how a story that was put in writing almost 3,000 years ago still feels very contemporary, not because of the content itself, but rather because of its narrative structure. But let's return to our story, and before we find out where Odysseus was for all these years, we're going to make a first stop at Ithaca, which has changed a lot in his absence. In his small kingdom of Ithaca, his wife, Penelope, and son, Telemachus, who was still an infant when his father had gone to war, anxiously awaited a reunion with their husband and father. Odysseus had been missing for several years, and only the thinnest thread of hope remained that they would one day see him again. It turns out that Odysseus wasn't dead, and that his protector goddess Athena had not abandoned him but that his journey home became one of the most extraordinary adventure tales ever told. And this is a story I'm going to share with you tonight. Long before the Trojan War, Odysseus had reigned over his island of Ithaca with his wife Penelope, a Spartan princess, he had fallen in love with her when in Sparta and brought her back with him to Ithaca. Years later, in the event that led to the Trojan War, Helen of Sparta was abducted by Paris of Troy. Her lawful husband, Menelaus, called upon the kings of Greece to defend his honor and retrieve his wife. Odysseus was one of those kings called upon, but he had no taste for adventure or war, especially so far from home. So he tried to avoid having to get involved by pretending he was crazy. When Menelaus's envoy arrived in Ithaca, Odysseus hooked a honky and ox to his plow and started sowing his fields with salt. His ploy was quickly revealed as deception when one of his envoys placed Odysseus's infant, the young Telemachus, in front of the plow. Odysseus stopped in his tracks, thus exposing that he was only pretending to be insane. He was forced to follow the envoy into war against his will. And his example and attitude were contrary to many heroes of the time who were models of bravery and honor. Odysseus was more cautious. He wasn't a coward, and he knew how to take risks and when. Years later, he hid inside the Trojan horse. But Odysseus was also a family man, not an adventurer, and was deeply attached to his home and family. It would have deeply saddened him to know what transpired in Ithaca in his absence when he failed to return from the war. Several months after the war ended and other kings had returned, Dozens of suitors from Ithaca had invaded Odysseus's place, where Penelope and Telemachus still lived. They wanted Penelope to acknowledge that her husband was dead, and each of them attempted to win her hand in marriage. These suitors couldn't even wait for confirmation of Odysseus's death to start stealing from him. They lived in his house, ate his cattle and harvest, and disrespected his wife, 
by pressuring her to marry, becoming bolder and more insolent every day. By now, Telemachus was no longer an infant but a young man. He became more and more enraged each day by the impudence of these wannabe suitors, but didn't know what to do to restore order in his father's palace. Lucky for him and for Penelope, this was about to change. During these years, Odysseus enjoyed the protection of the goddess Athena. Thanks to her powers, she knew that Odysseus was still alive and why he had not returned home. It turns out that Odysseus had incurred the wrath of Poseidon, the god of the seas, during the Trojan War. Athena was firmly on the side of the Greeks, whereas other gods like Poseidon, Aphrodite, and Apollo supported the Trojans. And while these gods had had to accept the fall of Troy, some, like Poseidon, continued to hold a grudge against Odysseus. The Greek king was not only directly responsible for the fall of Troy, he had also achieved the defeat of Troy using a horse, and Poseidon was also the god of horses. One day, Poseidon left Mount Olympus, the residence of the gods, to accept a sacrifice far in the south, in Ethiopia. Athena took advantage of his absence to ask Zeus, the king of the gods, to finally allow Odysseus to return home. Zeus consented to it, and Athena immediately drew up plans to help the lost hero. At the time, Odysseus was being held captive on an island. Had been for several years already, imprisoned against his will by Calypso, a nymph. But since his departure from Troy, and before his arrival at Calypso's island, Odysseus had lived through a series of extraordinary events. When the war ended, Odysseus left Troy with twelve ships, hoping to arrive in Ithaca a few weeks later. But his companions wanted to return home with more treasures that they had already looted from Troy, and insisted on launching a raid on Ismarus, a defenseless coastal city in Thrace not far from the fresh ruins of Troy. Odysseus didn't like the idea, and he was eager to return home as soon as possible. But after ten years of war, Odysseus's fellow warriors felt what they had pillaged from Troy was not enough of a prize. And so Odysseus finally agreed to the raid. The Greeks sacked Ismarus, divided their ill-gotten gains among themselves, and then, instead of leaving immediately, began to feast despite Odysseus urging everyone to depart. While at Ismarus, Odysseus had spared the life of a priest of Apollo and his family, to thank him, the priest gave him a bottle of black wine, some gold, and a mixing bowl. The wine was a strong and delicious drink. It was so concentrated that for each cup of wine, twenty times as much water needed to be added to dilute it. Odysseus didn't know what to do with this very special bottle of wine but it could always be useful, so he held it in safekeeping. Tired from fighting and feasting, the Greeks fell asleep in the ruins of their excesses. So when the next morning, when the inhabitants of Ismarus returned with reinforcements, 
the looters were surprised and outnumbered by the angry crowd. They had to hastily escape, and Odysseus lost many men on their return to their ships and before continuing the journey to Ithaca. The god Poseidon watched all of this unfold, and he was determined to punish Odysseus for his role in the fall of Troy. Poseidon sent storms that drove the small feet off course and scattered the twelve ships. After days spent fighting the elements, Odysseus's ships reached an island that could offer temporary shelter and allow them to make repairs before resuming their journey home. On this island, Odysseus and his fellows found an abundance of lush, wild vegetation, flowers and appetizing nuts that resembled a natural garden. They soon encountered the island's inhabitants who simply smiled and welcomed them and didn't seem particularly interested in asking where they came from. The Greek warriors observed that the island's residents spent their day almost exclusively sleeping and eating flowers and fruits from the magnificent tree at the center of the island. When asked what this tree was, the natives said it was the lotus tree and that it provided everything they could ever wish for, a life of drowsiness, oblivion, and bliss. They offered flowers and fruits to Odysseus's companions, who soon joined the lotus eaters in their state of stupor. It turned out that, for generations, lost ships had stumbled upon this island and, partaking of the lotus tree, had forgotten about their previous lives, their loved ones, and their homes and instead began living a permanent fugue state where nobody and nothing ever existed, where time was abolished and the past or the future no longer mattered. Odysseus understood the appeal and the danger of the lotus tree. The memory of his island of Penelope and his son, Telemachus, were precious enough to his heart to renounce the bliss induced by the lotus tree. But all of his companions were now unconscious, and Odysseus had to carry them, one by one, back to the ships. When they woke up and begged for more flowers and fruits from the seductive lotus tree, Odysseus forced them to fast instead. The warriors wept. They soon recovered and remembered who they were. Odysseus asked his companions whether they would rather stay on the island with the lotus eaters and forget everything, or return home. As the effects of the drug were now fading, the warriors decided to leave and the expedition resumed its journey. As we have already talked about in previous stories about mythology and how mythological tales in ancient Greek society often served as more than just entertainment. In this case, the story is obviously meant to serve as a cautionary tale against addiction. And beyond that, as an invitation to reflect on what remains of your humanity if you decide to renounce your memory and abdicate all responsibility. Is the ability to stop suffering, stop caring, however appealing, a fair trade for your humanity? The story of the Lotus Eaters presents the wish for oblivion as a death wish. Obliterating everything that makes one human is a form of death, though not a biological one. 
escaping everything that makes us human, including suffering, means essentially disappearing and makes us as good as dead to others. The temptation to live as a zombie can be, oddly, highly seductive, and rejecting this escape from reality is not easy or immediately gratifying. It's hard and uncomfortable. It takes resilience, but at least for Odysseus, it will be worth it in the end because the story has a happy ending, but not before experiencing trials and suffering. These concepts of self-control, moderation, and responsibility were highly praised and valued in classical Greek culture and were some of the qualities expected from citizens. To an extent, they are universal because they are necessary to make any society work. But Greek literature is innovative in that it is one of the first examples in the world of intellectual works that integrates these values into storytelling, building tales around moral concepts. Another innovation specific to the Odyssey is its narrative structure. It's a poem, like the Iliad, and it recounts a short period of time at the end of the Trojan War. Both are very long poems. The Odyssey, for example, has more than 12,000 lines. The poem, as I mentioned earlier, was probably intended to be heard rather than read, but as a work of literature, it looks more like a modern novel than an ancient poem. Employing modern structural devices, the plot is nonlinear. There are flashbacks, elements that fill the blanks of the story of the Trojan War, as told in the Iliad. The account of the Trojan horse, for example, was not in the Iliad, and we only learn about it in the Odyssey from Odysseus. But the Odyssey has a way of keeping people on the edge of their seats. It doesn't begin as a linear storyline when Odysseus leaves Troy. It begins instead in Ithaca, ten years after the end of the Trojan War. And we learn then about the situation of the island with Odysseus's wife, Penelope, the invasion of her palace by suitors. Athena intervenes to help Odysseus return home. We learn later that he is kept prisoner by the nymph Calypso on her island. Calypso has to free him because, Zeus, sends the messenger of the gods, Hermes, to order her to do so after Athena has pleaded on Odysseus's behalf. Odysseus escapes, which I will tell you more about later, and reaches another island where he is offered hospitality and tells the story of his escapades since he left Troy. So we learn about earlier events through his account and the bulk of the Odyssey. All of Odysseus's adventures and misadventures as he attempted to return home unfolds as what we would call a series of flashbacks. It is a story within a story, and Odysseus is the narrator of our story tonight. I am taking all the elements from the Odyssey, but not telling them in the exact order they appear in the poem. If I had, you would have waited another half hour long before hearing about any of Odysseus's actual adventures. Instead, I am going to follow the two main plot lines in parallel, one that happens in the present of the narration ten years after Odysseus's disappearance, when we find him on Calypso's island, and one that happened in the past, 
the series of adventures he went through during those ten intervening years. The two plot lines join when Odysseus returns to Ithaca to claim his throne. As we discussed earlier, Athena obtained the liberation of her favorite hero from the island of Calypso, but she also wanted him to return home and retake his throne. After visiting Zeus to secure Odysseus's freedom, she herself went to Ithaca. The goddess disguised herself as a chieftain from the island of Taphos. The Taphians were renowned sea travelers and sometimes pirates who knew a lot about what happened at sea. Athena, as a chieftain, visited Telemachus to urge him to leave the island in search of his father. Unaware that he was talking to a mighty goddess, Telemachus offered the chieftain hospitality, and that night Athena saw firsthand how the various would-be suitors imposed upon and disrespected the lawful queen and prince of Ithaca in the absence of Odysseus. That night, Athena changed her appearance again, from the chieftain disguised to look now like Telemachus, and she found a ship and a crew for the true prince. The next day, she convinced Telemachus to depart to the mainland to start searching for his father. Athena changed her appearance yet again, this time in the guise of Mentor, a wise and old man who had been charged by Odysseus to educate Telemachus and join Telemachus in his journey. Unaware that he was accompanied by Athena herself and not the real Mentor, Telemachus set sail for the Greek main island with the intention of visiting the most venerated surviving Greek warrior from the Trojan War, Nestor. Nestor was already old when the Trojan War began, but he had bravely led the armies of his kingdom, Pylos, and had helped Greek warriors with his sage guidance. But Nestor didn't know where Odysseus was and unfortunately couldn't help. After his visit to Nestor, Telemachus traveled to Sparta to talk to King Menelaus and his wife, Helen, who were now reconciled. You may recall that Helen had been kidnapped by Paris and taken to Troy, and it was to recover his wife that King Menelaus had started the Trojan War. But Helen was not herself when she had followed Paris to Troy. She had been the victim of a fit of lust brought on by Aphrodite. Melanaeus and Helen told Telemachus that their voyage back from Troy had also been long and difficult. They had gone to Egypt during their travels back to Sparta, and there, on the island of Pharaohs, Menelaus had encountered an old god of the sea, Proteus. And Proteus had told Melanaeus that Odysseus had gone through many hardships on his voyage home and was now a captive of the nymph Calypso on her island. Telemachus was sad to learn how hard it had been for his father but was also overjoyed to realize that his father was still alive. Learning the news, Telemachus was assured that his hope of seeing his father again had been justified. However, the Sudas in Odysseus's palace soon realized that Telemachus had escaped from Ithaca, and angry that they had let it happen, they formulated a plan to ambush his ship when he returned. 
Elimachus and Penelope's trials were substantial, but Odysseus and his men had suffered through much more significant ordeals since their departure from Troy ten years earlier. They had narrowly escaped the vengeful inhabitants of Ismarus and the seductive trap of the Lotus Eaters. But it seemed to them that, after so much danger, their luck was turning. They approached a new island that looked welcoming and which was a perfect place to rest and find food. What they didn't know, unfortunately, was that this island belonged to the Cyclopes. The Cyclopes were one-eyed giants, by which I mean they each had only one eye in the center of their foreheads. They lived in the world of men, but not among them. The location of their land was unknown, and many even doubted their existence, but they were real. They lived like men did before they became civilized. They were shepherds with herds of giant sheep, but had no agriculture, no wine, and they lived in caves. Their father was Poseidon, the god of the seas, who responded to that which displeased him with blind fury. The Cyclopes were savages. They slaughtered and ate all who came to their land, and they lived solitary lives with no interest in knowing anything about the world. Odysseus and his companions were oblivious to the danger they faced, not knowing that they had landed close to the lair of a cyclops. A terrifying giant named Polyphemus in their search for provisions, Odysseus, along with a group of men, found the entrance to the Cyclopes' lair. Looking in the cave, they found more cheese and meat that they could ever have dreamed of finding. But as they were celebrating their good fortune, Polyphemus returned to the cave with his flock. Having entered his cave to find unwanted visitors, Polyphemus sealed its entrance with a great stone, ignoring the rules of hospitality and seizing the opportunity to eat something new. He called over two of the men and promptly ate them. He then fell asleep, and Odysseus and the surviving men spent the rest of the night hiding and trembling unable to escape the cave as the entrance was blocked by a rock so large that no man could ever move it. In the morning, the giant cyclops killed and ate two more men before leaving the cave to tend to his sheep. Still unable to escape the cave, Odysseus and his men spent the day thinking of possible ways to flee but the situation seemed hopeless, and they figured it was only a matter of time before the Cyclops would kill and eat them all. After Polyphemus returned in the evening and ate two more men, Odysseus finally had an idea. He offered the Cyclops some of the strong and undiluted wine that he had received as a gift earlier from the priest of Apollo, whose life he had spared in Ismarus. The Cyclops didn't know what wine was, and Polyphemus soon grew drunk and careless. He asked Odysseus his name and promised a gift if he answered. Odysseus told him his name was Nobody, and as a reward, Polyphius only promised to eat nobody last of all, and with that he fell into a drunken sleep. But Odysseus was not one to stand still and wait for death. During the time spent plotting their escape from the cave, 
Odysseus had hardened a wooden stake in the fire. So when the giant fell asleep, Odysseus was ready and drove the stake into the Cyclops' eye. Distraught and blinded, Cyclops called for help, and his brothers who lived in other caves on the island soon arrived. When they asked Polyphemus what had happened, he told them that nobody had heard him, and so they naturally thought Polyphemus was being afflicted by a fit of madness. They recommended he pray and rest. In the morning before leading his sheep out to graze, the blind cyclops felt their backs so as to be sure none of the men escaped as he left the cave. However, Odysseus and his men had tied themselves to the underside of the animals and so got away without the giant noticing. They ran to their ships and sailed off. But as soon as they left the shore, Odysseus, who was too proud of his intelligence, committed an act of hubris and revealed his real name. The giant heard him and cast huge rocks towards Odysseus's ship, which barely missed hitting them. Worse than the rocks, Polyphemus also prayed to his father Poseidon for revenge. Poseidon was already angry at Odysseus. He would now be furious. Before we continue with the stories of his many adventures, Let's take a look at Odysseus himself. To the Greeks, Odysseus was maybe the most popular of all heroes. He is different from most of the others. All Greek heroes are role models of some kind, but they are not all the same. They have different personalities, and they also have flaws, alongside some outstanding talents. Some may be extraordinary warriors who have also a whimsical or bad character, like Achilles as presented in the Iliad. Some are reckless or commit horrible crimes, like Heracles, who killed his wife and children in a fit of rage. In the case of Odysseus, the quality that stands out most is his intelligence. He embodies various definitions of the word, he comprehends things quickly. He anticipates things. He's also able to trick others. But this intelligence also has its limits. Odysseus doesn't always anticipate the consequences of his actions, like when he angers the gods or when he reveals his real name to the Cyclops. He likes to brag. And like anyone else who claims to be smart, the claim itself reveals the limits of his intelligence. He fails to understand how he is going to be perceived by others. And his lack of self-awareness, this pride can lead to hubris. That is to say, the Greeks felt that an excess of self-confidence could also lead to excessive pride or defiance towards the gods and bring disaster. This is a serious flaw and one of several other characteristics that make Odysseus a human hero. He's not particularly brave. He pretends to be insane to avoid the Trojan War. But he is also loyal. He loves his wife, his son, his land, and in Greek mythology, be it in the Iliad or the Odyssey, or any of the other stories in the same cycle, Odysseus is on the right side, the side of the Greeks, the side we are invited to root for. He is presented as likable in the Greek tradition. But later, when the Romans adopted many Greek myths and added their own, 
they turned him into a villain, focusing on the less honorable aspects of the character. To the Romans, who Romanized many names, he was Ulysses. The Romans knew the Odyssey, they studied it and appreciated it. But in their culture, many of his actions, the tricks and strategies he employed, his attempt to avoid his sacred oath to defend Menelaus and Helen and not join the Trojan War, all of this offended their notion of honor and duty. It depended somewhat on the period of time or the author, but in general, the Romans were more rigid and more strict about these values in comparison with the Greeks, who had a more nuanced view of them and could appreciate a good trickster. The Roman rejection of Odysseus or Ulysses culminated in the Aeneid, which is a Latin epic poem written in the first century B.C., modeled after the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Aeneid is less universally famous than the Odyssey, but the story itself is really creative and really interesting. It's a mythical retelling of the origins of Rome that follows the travel of Aeneas, one of the Trojan heroes from the Iliad. But instead of dying when Troy falls, Aeneas escapes a long journey to Italy where he became the first Roman. The Aeneid makes the Romans the descendants of the Trojans. Acknowledging their connection to Greek civilization while also drawing a distinct line between the two societies. As a key player in the fall of Troy, with the Trojan horse trick, Odysseus appears as a villain in the Aeneid and is constantly referred to as cruel or deceitful. The Aeneid was written by Virgil, a poet, at the time of the fall of the Republic, when Rome became an empire and expanded faster than ever. At the time, educated people were probably well aware that the Aeneid was not history and was just a work of fiction made to cement a Roman myth. But Odysseus, as a result, took on the image of a villain with an antagonist. It was centuries before his reputation, his character, and the general positive impression we have of him nowadays were restored. Now, let's resume our story. Odysseus had foolishly boasted and revealed his real name to the Cyclops. He could avoid the rocks the giant threw, but not the curse of Poseidon. The Cyclops prayed to his father, Poseidon, and asked him to curse Odysseus, to curse him to wander the sea for ten years, during which time he would lose all of his crew. Following their escape from the land of the Lotus Eaters, Odysseus and his men reached the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, near the island of Sicily. He and his men had narrowly escaped death from the Cyclops, but they also hadn't found the supplies they desperately needed. So, as soon as they saw another island where they could anchor, they decided to make a stop. The island was not on any map because it was a floating island. And it belonged to King Aeolus, a powerful but benevolent man whom the gods had made keeper of the winds. Even though he wasn't a god, his control of the winds and his dominion over the surface of the seas gave the keeper of the winds power and wealth enough to rival Poseidon himself. King 
Aeolus greeted Odysseus and gave him and his crew hospitality for a month. The keeper of the winds appreciated Odysseus and decided to help him return home, telling our hero that he would provide his ship with the exact wind it needed to deliver them back to Ithaca, and he gave Odysseus a large leather bag that contained all the winds, minus the gentle west winds, a gift that would ensure a quick and safe return home. Rested and optimistic, the Greeks returned to their ships after thanking King Aeolus and set sail for their island. As promised by the Keeper of the Winds, the journey was fast and even, and Ithaca appeared on the horizon. After just a few days, relieved but exhausted, Odysseus fell asleep, dreaming of his coming reunion with Penelope and his home. But his men were intrigued by the leather bag and thought it contained a treasure given by King Aeolus. If it was gold, it was only fair that they receive their share. And so, as Odysseus slept, they opened the bag to reveal its contents. All at once, all of the winds flew out, and a violent storm drove the ship away from Ithaca. After hours of stormy conditions during which they could not control their ship, Odysseus and his foolish companions realized they had once again arrived at the floating island of Aeolus. King Aeolus believed that this was a sign that Odysseus had drawn the ire of the gods upon himself, and afraid to displease the gods, he refused to help again. Empty-handed, and still followed by the wrath of Poseidon. Odysseus had to leave the island. The men re-embarked, and on their next stop, once again, faced cannibalistic giants, though not Cyclopes this time, but a tribe of man-eating giants who had sprung from the son of Poseidon, Lestrigon. For this reason, they were known as Lestrigonans. As soon as Odysseus sailed close to the coast of their island, they attacked with rocks, and the king of Ithaca once again narrowly escaped death while losing many of his companions. His ship was severely damaged, and as they limped along their journey, almost grounded on the beach of another island where a new, dangerous fate awaited them. The island belonged to Circe, an ancient sorceress. Circe was a daughter of the god of the sun, Helios, and was renowned for her vast knowledge of potions and herbs and for her terrifying magic powers. She lived in a palace far from any human presence, in the midst of a dense wood surrounded by lions wolves, and many other animals, all of which were surprisingly docile. But Circe's island hid a terrible secret. Using her beautiful singing voice, Circe attracted travelers to her island and then invited them to a feast. At the feast, she would then drug them with potions that made her unfortunate victims shapeshift into animals. The lions and wolves living around Circe's place were, in reality, men who had the misfortune of crossing her path. But nobody knew, as no one had ever escaped the island to share Circe's terrible secret. When Odysseus and his crew landed on the island, 
most of the men set off to explore it, while their leader stayed on the ship. The crew met Circe, who naturally invited them to a feast that the hungry sailors could not resist. Of course, Circe had already mixed one of her magical potions into the dishes. And all of Odysseus' crew turned into pigs. The only man to escape, becoming a swine, was Odysseus' second-in-command, Eurylochus, who had remained cautious and not touched the food. Eurylochus returned to the ship and informed Odysseus, who immediately went on a rescue mission. He walked to the palace, but before he reached it, the messenger of the gods, Hermes, appeared, sent by Athena. Hermes revealed to Odysseus how Circe could be defeated and gave Odysseus an herb that would protect him from the effects of her potions. Hermes recommended that Odysseus draw his sword and force Circe to swear that she would not take any further actions against him. Odysseus, following these instructions, was able to force the powerful enchantress to free his men. The crew was changed into human beings again and exhausted, needed to rest, as did Odysseus. But despite what she had done, Odysseus couldn't help but notice that Circe was one of the most beautiful women he had ever seen almost rivaling the legendary beauty of Helen of Sparta. The men's stay on the island lasted another ten days, then ten weeks, and finally, as Odysseus began to share Circe's bed, months that extended to an entire year. Odysseus was still homesick, and the charms of Circe had still not erased his memory of Penelope. One day, he resolved to leave the ancient sorceress and resume his journey. Circe, who knew the hearts of men and could see glimpses of the future, was not surprised. So she did not oppose Odysseus' decision, but instead instructed him that, in order to return to Ithaca, he would first have to visit the Underworld. The entrance to the Underworld was in the west, where the sun goes to die every evening before it reappears in the east every morning. Guided by Circe's instructions, Odysseus and his crew crossed the Mediterranean Sea far, far to the west near the pillars of Heracles that marked the end of the world and the beginning of an endless ocean. They reached a harbor at the western edge of the world, where Odysseus sacrificed to the dead. Darkness fell around him, and suddenly Odysseus found himself in an unknown wasteland where the ghost of the dead wandered aimlessly. He first encountered the spirit of one of his crewmen, Elpinor, who had died on Circe's island. Elpinor had fallen off a roof and his body had not been found. He asked for Odysseus to find and bury his remains, which Odysseus promised to do. He then summoned the spirit of Tiresias, a prophet of Apollo, who had died long before and was famous for his clairvoyance. Odysseus asked the spirit how to appease Poseidon, and the prophet told him that one day he and his crew would reach an island where Helios, the sun god, 
kept to sacred livestock. If they refrained from eating the animals, then he may return home. But a failure to do so would result in the loss of his ship and his entire crew. Next, Odysseus met the spirit of his dead mother. She had died of grief during his long absence, and it was from her he first heard about his household and the suitors who threatened his family with their greed and insolence. Odysseus stayed and talked to the spirit of his fallen companions, like Agamemnon and Achilles, until the fog around him began to dissipate. A ray of sunshine pierced the darkness, then two, then three, and he realized that he had left the underworld and returned to the world of the living. The entire crew returned to Circe's island and, as promised, search for the remains of Elpinor, the fallen crewman, and buried him. They said goodbye to Circe, who gave them enough food to continue their journey. However, leaving Circe's island to the east would force them to skirt to the land of the Sirens who were some of the most dangerous monsters in the entire world. The sirens were not terrifying creatures who threatened sailors with sharp teeth and claws, but with their voices. The sirens were half women, half birds, and attracted nearby sailors with their enchanting music and singing voices. Voices so seductive that no man could resist their allure. Ships would constantly try to approach the rocky coasts of their island and be shipwrecked, even though sailors knew that answering the song of the sirens was deadly. Odysseus had a plan to survive the sirens and ordered his crewmen to plug their ears with beeswax. But he himself was too curious to resist the temptation to hear the enchanting song of the sirens. So he asked his men to tie him to the mast and to not untie him under any circumstance. As the ship approached the sirens' island, Odysseus heard their song and his will was instantly annihilated. All he could think of was to jump into the sea and swim toward the sirens. Luckily for Odysseus, his men respected and followed his orders, and their ears plugged with beeswax couldn't hear him begging to be untied. So the ship successfully passed the island without any losses. But this region of the sea was full of dangers. The ship now had to pass through a narrow channel of water where two deadly threats awaited sailors. On one side, Scylla, a six-headed monster, was ready to capture any passing ship and smash it to pieces. On the other side, within an hour's distance, was Charybdis, a powerful whirlpool that sank any vessel that got too close. The only way to avoid one of these dangers was to pass too close to the other, and most ships attempting to cross the channel ended up destroyed. Only a very difficult, extremely narrow path lay between the two which allowed for safe passage. Odysseus and his crew had no choice but to risk it. As they entered the channel, the waters became agitated and 
Scylla's six heads ventured dangerously close to the ship. At one point, Scylla did manage to snatch up six men, who died crushed between its toes. But the convoy of ships finally crossed successfully and soon arrived in quieter waters. Soon, on the horizon, appeared the island of Helios. This was the island where the sun god kept his livestock. That Odysseus had been strictly instructed by Pyrrhus to not eat no matter what. Odysseus wanted to stay away from the island, but his crew was becoming more and more unruly after so many ordeals, and they decided to override his orders. The ship landed on the island, and the crew, who had been given so much food by Circe, promised Odysseus that they would not even look at Helios' livestock and that they would resume their journey very soon. But the gods were watching. The desperate attempts of his crew to return home and had grown angry at Odysseus. Not only had he displeased Poseidon at Troy and then further offended him by blinding his cyclops son, but Odysseus had also defied the gods by receiving help from the Keeper of the Winds and had just had a bit too much luck in escaping so many dangers. And because the gods were cruel and liked to play with the lives of men, Zeus caused a storm to prevent the crew from leaving the island, a storm that never seemed to end. Days passed. Odysseus spent his time praying to the gods, hoping to appease them. The crew needed to eat and had already depleted the supplies given to them by Circe. After days spent fasting, the men grew unbearably hungry. They ignored the orders of Odysseus, who was away praying and they hunted the sacral cattle of Helios. The sun god was infuriated and asked Zeus to punish the crew. In response, Zeus suspended the war, letting the men think that they could now live. But as soon as they tried to once again depart, the storm resumed stronger than ever. The ship was out of control as the storm drove it towards Charybdis, the monstrous whirlpool. Their ship crumbled as it entered the whirlpool. Only Odysseus was able to grab the branches of a fig tree that hung above Charybdis and as he clung to the tree, he watched in horror as the last of his companions drowned, and their bodies and the remains of their ships were sucked into the black abyss. Odysseus was now alone. His ship was lost. All of his men were dead. They had eaten the cattle of Helios, and the prophecy was now fulfilled. Our hero was now more alone and more desperate than ever. Odysseus floated out the sea, waiting for death to take him, as all hope had now vanished. He had seen too much, lost too much, was too exhausted to cry and too broken to find a reason to live. But it was written that life still had more in store for Odysseus. And so it was that he washed ashore on yet another island where the nymph Calypso lived. 
The nymphs care for Odysseus and healed his body, but not his heart, as only his wife Penelope and his homeland could bring him any peace. Days passed, and his strength returned. Calypso made him her lover, but he didn't feel anything. Weeks passed, then months, and without a ship or any idea where he was, there was no possibility of escape. The months added up until Odysseus had been a prisoner on the island for two years. After the years of excitement, of danger, and action, his life turned to boredom, homesickness, and desperation. Seven years passed. Odysseus had lost all track of time and didn't even realize that it had been nearly ten years since his departure from Troy. Nor did he remember that Poseidon's curse, after Odysseus blinded the Cyclops, was nearing its end, and that he still had an ally on Mount Olympus, Athena. As we saw at the beginning of our story, Odysseus' son, Telemachus, was now an adult. He had received a visit from Athena in disguise, who guided him to the mainland to investigate his father's whereabout. Athena also convinced Zeus to send the messenger of God, Hermes, to Calypso's island to instruct her to release her prisoner. Calypso had no choice but to accept. She gave Odysseus a small boat and let him go. He sailed a few days without seeing anyone, before reaching an island where friendly locals showed him hospitality. They recognized the new arrival as the king of Ithaca whose legend after the Trojan War and subsequent mysterious ten years' disappearance was now established. Odysseus recounted all that had happened to him, and as they learned all their dramatic details of his incredible journey, they resolved to help him. That night when Odysseus slept, the locals defied Poseidon's curse and swiftly conveyed him to the shores of his homeland. In the morning, Odysseus awoke on an unknown beach. Alone and disoriented, Athena appeared to him and revealed that he was back in his land, back to Ithaca. But she tempered his elation by explaining that he would have to fight to take back his home from the suitors and the traitors who had disrespected his house and family. Athena disguised Odysseus as an elderly beggar so he would be able to see for himself how things stood in his household. Meanwhile, Polemicus returned from his visit to Sparta and the father and son were secretly reunited in the home of one of Odysseus's old slaves, who had remained loyal to his master. Still disguised as a beggar, Odysseus went to his palace and saw his wife again for the first time in twenty years, but also witnessed firsthand how the suitors exploited his wealth and humiliated Penelope. But Athena was still working behind the scenes, and the next day she inspired Penelope to announce to the suitors that they would finally be able to compete for her hand. There would be an archery competition using Odysseus's bow, this bow was famously hard to string and required uncommon strength that few men possessed. Penelope announced 
that the man who was able to string the bow and shoot an arrow through a dozen aligned axe heads would win. The competition began in the palace's hall, with the suitors eager to show their talent and prowess. Odysseus, disguised as a beggar, watched the scene unfold. One after another, the suitors failed to shoot an arrow through the axe heads, until at last the unknown beggar stepped forward and offered to try. The suitors laughed, but Odysseus in disguise took up the bow and shot, sending the arrow right through the twelve axe heads. He then started shooting at the killers, killing them methodically with his bow and arrows. Inspired by Athena, Telemachus and other servants joined him and ferociously fight ensued until no suitors were left. When it was over, Odysseus removed his beggar's clothes and identified himself to Penelope. Penelope was hesitant at first, not recognizing this man who stood in front of her, so changed by time. But when he mentioned that he had made their bed from an olive tree that was still rooted to the ground, Penelope knew this man was her beloved Odysseus. After a decade of war, then another battling to return home, Odysseus was finally reunited with his family. The simple happiness he had been longing for for twenty years, the pleasures of home and hearth, had finally been granted. All's well that ends well. We've come to the end of our little journey tonight. I hope you enjoyed this adventure, and I invite you to discover and learn more. Now you can let go and sleep. And until we meet again, good night. Sleep well. <laughs>